Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to today's planning committee. This is not a public meeting, but a meeting the public can attend. I am Councillor Sue Farmer, Vice Chair of the Planning Committee and chairing the meeting today. Before we commence, I would like to outline the domestic, the domestic arrangements for this meeting. We are not expecting a fire practice today. If the fire alarm does sound, please leave the building by way of the fire exit through the door at the rear of the chamber on my right. When you have left the chamber, proceed down the stairway and exit through the emergency exit on the ground floor. If there is anyone with mobility issues, please wait in the refuge area at the top of the stairs where the emergency evacu evacuation lift is located and use the intercom situated to the left-hand side of the lift doors to call for assistance. The designated assembly point is in the public square in front of CAST beyond the fountain. I would like to inform members of the public and the press today, uh, uh, that today's meeting will be audio visually recorded. By entering the council chambers, you accept that you will be recorded and your images retained and broadcast by the council on the, its website and on YouTube. If anyone Intend, intends to record or film any part of today's meeting, please ensure that this does not disturb the conduct of the meeting and you only focus on recording those people participating. Please ensure that your mobile phones are switched to silent. May I remind anyone speaking in the meeting that you will need to press the red button underneath the microphone and ensure that the red light is illuminated. This will ensure that you are recorded. The meeting is preceded, proceeding today on the basis that all members of the committee have read their agenda papers thoroughly and are aware of what they are, will be considering today. If, em, if any member of the committee leave the chamber during consideration of an application, they should ensure that they do not take part in the vote on their return, as they will not have heard all the relevant information on that particular item. Thank you. Right, we're moving on to item one. Apologies for absence. I've received um, absences from Chair Councillor Susan Durant, Councillors Amy Dixon and Andy Pickering. Are there any other apologies? No other apologies, thank you. Item two, exclusion of the public and press. There are no exemptions, exempt items in today's agenda. Item three, declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest, please? No. <clears throat> uh, item four, minutes of the planning committee meeting held on 25th of July, 2023. Can the minutes be moved as a true and accurate record? Yes. Uh, is that seconded? Yes. Thank you. Agreed? Uh, item five, schedule of applications. Application one, application two two forward slash double zero one zero eight forward slash FUL. Uh, conversion of existing dwelling with, uh, with erection of rear extension to create seven one bedroom HMO units and conversion of rear building to create a one bedroom apartment at 18 Lifford Road, Wheatley, Doncaster, DN2 for BY. Mark Ramsey, Ramsey, the planning case officer, will introduce this item. Mark. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this application is to create a proposed house of multiple occupation with seven 
one bed units in Wheatley and conversion of an outbuilding to, to a single standalone apartment. This would be achieved by extending and converting a five bed house with a two store extension to the rear. The application proposal has been amended to satisfy the previous consultee objections by changes to the internal layout. The proposal originally sought permission for eight bedrooms, but following comments from the environmental health officer, the scheme was reduced in scale in order to provide acceptable standard of accommodation in terms of space, light, and ventilation inside the building, and therefore reduced to seven bedrooms. No external alterations are proposed to the front. However, a two-store extension is proposed on the rear. All the parking provision on Lifford Road is provided on the street. The proposal does not include dedicated parking spaces for occupiers. The objections have been raised by highway, uh, sorry, no objections have been raised by highways due to its sustainable location. This application is being presented to planning committee at the request of Councillor Kobe uh, due to concerns over the proliferation of houses and multiple occupation in this area and the number of objections received, and also due to the number of objections received to the proposal. Councillor Kobe has provided a statement because uh, she was unable to attend today. Uh, this is appended to your pre-committee amendments. Uh, the matters she raises covers the bathroom facilities, number of tenants in the building, waste handling, uh, parking, and noise. There was a, also there was a petition of 90 signatures objecting to the application, which was initially publicized when initially publicised, and 16 uh, uh, individual objections were all were also received. When the amended scheme was publicised, further 16 objections were also received. Matters raised include uh, pressure on drainage, fly tipping, antisocial behaviour, pressure on parking, noise nuisance, loss of privacy and harm to the character of the area. Lifford Road is a un uniform character consisting of two-storey terrace housing. The majority of the properties are red brick. Most of the properties have bay windows to the front at the ground level, some have, and some, including this one, have extended into the roof space. Most of the properties on the same side of Lifford Road have small courtyard gardens to the front, which can be used for bin storage. This property is at the end of the terrace, and there is a footway along the side of the property that serves to provide external access to the rear, uh, where it's, sorry, rear, prop, rear of the property, and has an alleyway also along in, running along the rear of the uh, rear of these buildings, which appears to be accessed from, which can be accessed from the rear yard separately from the outbuilding. The application sites in the residential policy area and as such policy 10 of the local plan supports residential development in principle, providing that it doesn't adversely affect the character of the area or detrimentally affect neighboring properties. Uh, policy 9 also sets out strict criteria in relation to the development of HMOs. The policy states that there are concerns around the quality of living for occupants of these dwellings. Proposals for HMOs will only be supported under very strict circumstances which provide adequate internal living standards, communal areas, sufficient accommodation for the number of residents, and are capable of conversion without harming the immunities of neighbouring residents and not result in over-concentration within the locality, and I'll discuss that element in more detail in a moment. The site is allocated within an Article 4 direction area, which removes permitted development rights to change use of dwelling houses to HMOs without the need for planning permission. However, this development would have required planning permission in any way because of the number of rooms, but the direct a point of um, information, the direction covers all HMOs. The Article 4 direction does not ultimately result in all HMOs being refused. However, it does mean the design and position of all HMOs require approval rather than just the ones, larger ones that can accommodate more than six people. And is not, while this isn't directly relevant to this proposal, it does mean that irrespective of the size of uh, proposals that may come forward, number and type of HMO in the same section of streets will, would be limited to this one and one other. How's, right. okay. Is that moving on? Okay. Housing Act um, outlines the legal minimum individual room size for one person um, and this must exceed six and a half square metres. However, in order to obtain an HMO licence in Doncaster, 
council encourages bedroom sizes of at least 10 square metres. And since this scheme was amended, all the proposed bedrooms exceed this threshold. Environmental health officers confirmed that the, based on the revised layout, the plan, the applicant would be able to obtain a license and space standards are satisfactory. The shared kitchen, dining and living space encourages tenants to mix and interact, which contributes to social and healthy well-being. As such, the overall size and layout of the property is considered to be suitable for the proposed use. Thus, therefore, the proposal weighs positively in these terms. The converted outbuilding is considered against the nationally described space standards, and thus this provides 48 um, requires. Sorry, this this example provides 48 square meters of internal space, which exceeds the uh, standard of 39 square meters, and also meets the other requirements for bedroom size and storage. So is considered acceptable. Uh, policy 10 states that residential development will be permitted where but where it doesn't detrimentally affect the amenities of neighbouring properties, the application sites bordered by existing residential development on each side, and there's only an alleyway, as I said, that, that separates houses to the south that fronts Ferrers Road. The extension to the rear provides additional bedroom space at first floor and provides the shared facilities at ground floor, with the rest of the ground floor becoming bedrooms. The new windows would face the rear, overlooking the existing yards, so not introducing overlooking or loss of privacy to adjacent properties and is sufficiently set in from adjacent boundaries that it's not over-dominant or introduces harmful overshadowing. The garden has a secured gate, a gated access onto the alleyway at the rear and down the side of the house. There's space to store beer, bins within the curtilage and, and a, a requirement uh, from the uh, Environmental Health Officer that waste storage scheme is, is agreed as, uh, as a condition. The objections raised in regards to loss of amenity are noted, but a scheme of noise insulation to the party wall to ensure the impacts to immediate neighbours are limited, and this has also been recommended as a condition by the Environmental Health Officer. The comings and goings generated by the numbers of occupants would not excessively exceed the possible if the original dwelling was filled by a large family, particularly as the roof space has already been converted and the building also capable of being extended, possibly with, without requiring planning permission. The design of the extension is considered to not adversely affect neighbouring residential properties through excessive overlooking or loss of privacy. The shared living space as well as the access to the outdoor area encourages social interaction and considered to provide suitable accommodation. The application site is positioned in a sustainable location. The site is approximately uh, just over a mile from Doncaster city centre and the transport interchange does within suitable walking distance it, or access by uh, public transport. In terms of connectivity, the application site is located approximately 200 metres from Beckett Road and a similar distance from Thorn Road, which are both served by regular buses, bus services to the city and other destinations across the borough. Beckett Road also provides a variety of shops and local amenities, and it's also a short, uh, and site's also a relatively short distance from, from the hospital as well as uh, doc doctors and dentist surgeries. While the application proposal does not provide off-street parking, the application site lies within a sustainable location, close, suitably close to the city centre and sustainable methods of transport. And given the type of, that, of accommodation, residents are less likely to have private transport given location and proximity uh, to local services. No objections were raised by the highways engineer. Wheatley area is considered to be the most populated area of Doncaster in terms of HMO properties. This is mainly due to the proximity to the hospital for doctors and nurses. The size and scale of the traditional housing in this area also means the existing properties can easily be converted to provide multiple bedrooms. The direction was, the Article 4 direction was brought in to force Sorry, excuse me. Uh, the Article 4 direction was brought in to cover this area along with the rest of the town ward and much of Hexthorpe. This requires all HMO development to require planning permission. Policy 9, as, as I've said before, sets out strict criteria uh, and this covers the quality of living standards, internal standards, external communal areas and adequate accommodation. In particular, subparagraph E 
makes it clear that proposed HMOs must not result in an over-concentration of HMOs. The four criteria that no more than uh, two HMOs are side by side, self-contained houses won't be sandwiched by HMOs, and no more than two HMOs are in a run of 20 properties on one side of the road. Using the HMO license data, which I've pasted um, onto the screen, um, we can see that there are no other HMOs on Lippard Road and so is compliant with the above requirements of policy nine. The small number of HMOs located on surrounding streets as shown on map four, so it's not considered to adversely affect the character of the surrounding area as they, they're relatively spaced apart. While it's important to look at internal standards, there's over 75 square metres of external communal space at the rear, which is sufficient to accommodate uh, bin storage, uh, outdoors, provide outdoor circulation space for residents, and also there's uh, a condition requiring some cycle storage to be provided uh, as part of uh, any positive decision. It's important to highlight as well that local and national policy promotes the need to support a mix of housing types, support a variety of market demand, and support different needs within the community. Uh, in, summary, the, the, in summary, the proposals considered in the context of the presumption of, in favor of sustainable development. Um, officers, it's been identified that no adverse economic environment or social harm would significantly or demonstrate outweigh the benefits identified in the proposal. The proposal is compliant with the adopted plan, local plan and adopted policies and there are no material considerations which indicate the application should be refused. Thank you, Matt. Uh, we've got a Mr. Richard Maddox, a member of the public, has requested to speak in opposition to the application. This is now your opportunity to address the committee for up to five minutes. Please press. Please press the red button when you want to speak and press it again to mute the microphone when you have concluded your submission. Thank you for this opportunity. I'd like to, in the next five minutes, be able to articulate the concerns of the residents of Lifford Road and the local community. As you all know, there's been a large number of representations and a signed petition objecting to this proposal. Our challenge is, does maximising the footprint of a traditional terraced house to obtain the maximum number of rentable bedsit units create a better place and to live for the community when the potential for any antisocial behaviour, noise, waste and environmental issues are measurably increased. From the onset, the design has been to create the maximum number of proposed individual bedsits that can possibly be fitted into the existing terraced house footprint. Planning states in the report that it can be argued that Article 4 direction is not directly relevant to this proposal as the development requires planning permission. But Article 4 highlights many of the concerns of the residents of Lifford Road, and more importantly, our concerns are the same concerns and issues identified by the Council themselves in their consultation paper in 2019. Article 4 identified that the central wards of Doncaster already have a large proportion of HMOs, some 987 of known identified. Many of these generate problems with antisocial behaviour and the conversion to HMOs has removed much needed family housing in these areas. The benefits of introducing Article 4 of that is that it would help safeguard the character of these urban communities and safeguard from the oversaturation of HMOs. Does granting the planning permission for this proposal work against the Council's own findings and removing much needed family housing and increasing the number of large HMOs? One of the greatest concerns of the community is antisocial behaviour. Planning decisions should be mitigate and reduce to a minimum potential adverse impact resulting from noise and avoid giving rise to significant adverse impacts on health and the quality of life. While some of these can be mitigated by physical material introductions, surely granting permission for an eight bed sit HMO does have the potential to adversely impact on noise and increase the potential for antisocial behaviour. Article 4 direction report identified that of all the HMOs in the town ward, 54% of them attracted complaints, and 66 of those complaints were for antisocial behaviour, noise nuisance, and waste refuge. 
by granting permission are we not adding to the potential of increased noise disturbance, police and local authority reporting and workload? Planning decisions should ensure developments will function well and add to the overall quality of the area. It is more than likely that the proposed development will house eight unrelated individuals not known to each other. It is not unreasonable to assume that these people will, over time, develop friendships and personal relationships, which will only increase the traffic and noise of individuals arriving and leaving this property. In the submitted plans, Unit 6 already has a double bed illustrated in the drawing, suggesting that it could be occupied by two people. Would that now make this development for nine individuals? The plans also include converting the existing garage at the bottom of the property into a self-contained bedsit. The conversion of this outbuilding will provide a loss of privacy to the adjacent properties. From the rear windows of 20 Lifford Road, the current garage, which is to be converted into the bedsit, can be clearly seen. And with the conversion introducing windows to its bedrooms, living spaces, there will be direct line of sight and loss of privacy to the existing properties on both sides. There is also concern that once completed, tenants will use the ungated alleyway to arrive and leave the proposed outbuilding rather than arrive and exit through the property's side exit. Currently, parking on Lifford Road for many residents is a challenge. It's a real worry for residents that with eight new individuals living at the property that parking will become an issue. There seems to be an assumption that all of the new tenants will be using public transport, yet Many of the street's existing residents also have access to the mentioned public transport and live in a close distance to the city centre. You have one minute remaining. But due to their working locations, work times and the simple fact of modern day life, most have a car as well. Will this not be the same for these new tenants? I ask the committee to consider these thoughts and that the street loses what is a family home and gains nothing apart from the potential of increased noise, antisocial behaviour, which is a real concern and a loss of privacy. How can a small terraced house, including any of its outbuildings, be allowed to expand to such a scale and size that it will have double, and in some instances, more than double occupancy of any other house in the street? Surely, by allowing and granting planning permission to develop a small terraced property to such a scale does create a real potential for increased antisocial behaviour in a street that currently has none. Thank you. Thank you. I will now ask the committee members if they wish to ask Mr. Maddock any questions in relation to his submission. No. Councillor Ogar. Can you just tell uh, what's the parking on the street like currently? The photograph showed quite a few spaces. Currently, during the actual day, because people are out at work, then there are spaces. But as people arrive back after work, those spaces are much of a premium, and therefore it's a first come, first served basis on the actual street. Is any members, any members want any more questions? No. Oh, sorry, Steve. Steve Cox. Sorry. And I know it, it, there's no response from police or anybody, but have, has anybody seen any? Because it's all open alleyways at back, and we know that attracts some undesirable people. Has there been anything that's been noted by anybody there? Any anything at all? Well, the, the proper sorry, Lifford, Lifford Road, which is my mother-in-law, was broken into recently in the sheds because it's an open access down the back, as you quite rightly point out. The garage that's going to be converted goes straight onto the actual alleyway and this is one of the few ungated alleyways in, in the area. So there is free access to and from the actual property. Do you know if there's any plan to make it gated? No. There I'm isn't un to it, unaware of any okay. to do that, yeah. Thank you. Any more questions from the members? No. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Kay, the, applicants, the applicant has requested to speak in, in support of the application. This is now your opportunity to address the committee. Right, I won't double that. Right, so, sorry about that. Mr. Kay, we've been told that he's not attending today. So, right, I will now ask the committee. Wait a minute. Right. Committee members, we will now go into debate 
Does any, mini any member wish to comment on the report or ask the planning case officer a question? Right, we've got uh, Iris Beach, Councillor Iris Beach, and then Charlie Ogarth. Thank you. Um, can uh, the officer please put up the pictures of the, the layout, which is Appendix 2? Because what I want to speak about is... Right, it's the... That one, that's it. That's what I wanted to say. Um, on there, the kitchen and the living areas, I take it, are communal areas. Yes. Uh, that's right, yes. Right. So the entrance into Unit 2, those doors on the back, are they sort of French doors that would normally be not an entrance? You know, they'd be like out onto a pat the patio or the, the, the outside area. Because otherwise, the, the occupant of unit two, should this be passed, would have to go into the living area to go into their unit. Um, am I right there? Yes, that, that, that's right. So, it, so in theory, if something went off in the living area, they actually probably could be trapped in there. Um, Anyway, you, you've clarified what I wanted to know. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Yeah, the, there is actually a door from the living area into yeah. Unit 2. They've also got the patio doors at, at the back. Yeah, but yeah, but those patio doors come right by the bed, presumably, so they would be basically locked most of the time. Well, all of the time, I should think. Yeah, I, that's why they've uh, the annotated the... Environmental Health Officer uh, required them to have tri trickle yeah. uh, vents and, uh, and, and fan lights uh, built into the design of the opening so mm -hmm. that, you know, obviously the, if they are locked most of the time, there's still ventilation available. Mm. Okay, thanks very much. Councillor Ogarth. Yeah, I've got three issues. Uh, the ventilation for the bathroom in Unit 2 how would that be uh, dealt with? And the outside area is 72 square, 75 square metres, communal area. Um, then you've got bin storage and cycle storage. So how much actually usable space would be outside for the tenant to use? And how would they get what sort what sort of bins would there be? Because if the large bins, getting them out of, on bin day is difficult because it's just normal domestic day. And okay. Okay. The with HMOs, they they're not essentially commercial buildings. So uh, waste how waste and recycling uh, team treat it, it is as a regular dwellings so you'd have the normal uh, normal three bins the uh, for, for the garden for for general waste for for recycling um, and because it's an HMO they're entitled to apply for an additional general storage bin so it wouldn't be a case of you know the uh, you know the, the big containers that you see at, at the back of the uh, you know, a retail unit or a, or a warehouse, trying to get that out into the alleyway or in, or into the front, it would still be the be, be the regular uh, bins. And with, with this site, it does have a passageway down the side of the um, outbuilding at the back, directly onto the uh, alleyway, and also a passageway down the side of the uh, of, of the actual house, so there's access to to the to the front as well. Um, as I mean, there's, see the standard. I mean, I think the minimum standard for uh, that you'd expect for uh, you know shared space is 50 cubic meters. So you know, you've still got obviously 25 cubic meters would be should be more than ample for a uh, bike store and a uh, you know and you know places to put the uh, to keep the bins outside. So the cycle and the bin storage would be like 50, uh, 25 square metres. Is that reasonable to assume? 
Uh, yeah, I would have thought so, yes. I think, just if I can jump in, councillors, I think it's important to, to reference page 25 of your agenda packs. So there are a couple of conditions on there. So we're, we're obviously content that there is enough space in order to accommodate the uh, cycle storage and refuge uh, requirements. Conditions three and five of your agenda pack require the developer to effectively provide us with information to show how that's going to work. Um, so at the moment, we've not got the specific details, but what we are content is that there's enough space in order to accommodate those two, two aspects. So we'll deal with that as part of the discharge of condition application. Can I just clarify, I thought that what the Planning Commission is doing is looking, if it's looking. So this rare solution to the bin story might not be suitable for the Planning Commission. You know, it might just take up, well, it's not practical. Theoretically, you can get so many bins, but practical wise, everybody has always got to be get access to their bin. Yeah, pl planning committee are dealing with a land use matter primarily here. Uh, th there's a change of use application that's been submitted. That's, that's what you're dealing with. You, you've also got uh, material planning considerations, which are, as you've said, um, in relation to waste management, cycle storage. We're content there's enough space in order to, to deal with those two aspects. Uh, the planning authority is able to impose planning conditions that would make development which would otherwise be unacceptable acceptable. Uh, there are technical matters in terms of the level of the standard of uh, information that we would require and that will be done in consultation with uh, waste management teams uh, and likely in relation to the uh, cycle storage our transportation team. <laughs> Councillor Bob Anderson. Yeah, <clears throat> like Councillor Hogarth, I've got real worries about the waste management plan or the lack of it, to be honest. Three bins ain't going to cut it for eight to nine people and the space at the front ain't going to hold that. I've just got real concerns that you know, prior to approval, there's not any real details on the waste management plan. Yeah, I, I understand where you're coming from. Um, Ultimately, there's no there's no statutory requirement for them to submit a waste management plan. We're, we're confident that you could accommodate the. I know I sound like a broken record here, but you can accommodate sufficient space within 25 square meters to put bins to accommodate this level of development. Councillor Sofalu. I have a question. I'm a little bit considered is about the kitchen. Only 14 square meter. It's not quite big. I would just consider if seven people want to cook at the same time, are they capable to cooking at the same time? And how many cookers in there? If people have to wait a couple of hours to make their own dinner, that will be not a really enjoy life, is it? Thank you. Okay, um, well the kitchen, for, yeah, 14 square, square meters um, rather, rather than 10. Um, see, it's it shared, ultimately it's shared accommodation. The environmental health officer has said that uh, they're content with it, that they're the experts when, when dealing with uh, applications for houses of multiple, multiple occupation, that that is sufficient to space for for this type of accommodation and if they didn't and, and they've said that you know uh should yourselves approve it and then it comes for for them to issue um you know a license they they would issue a license on on that basis so uh i you know rely on them to you know guide that you know that is sufficient uh, you know shared space for uh for, for the number of people expected to uh, uh, use that building Councillor Duncan Anderson. Thank you. Uh, can you tell me what the orientation of the outbuilding is relative to the uh, main house? I'm looking at the floor plan for it on page 27, but there's no indication of which way it faces. Yeah, it's at... Okay, okay so the... 
the windows uh, face north into the um, I I into the communal area. So the so where you see the uh, on the on on the bottom of the of the floor plan. Um, That's facing the, towards the, the main door, house. The doors and windows face yeah f face face into the the court okay. the yard area, and the double doors at the back um, open into the alleyway. Right, so I've got a number of concerns with that then. First off is it's going to be very dark in there. You're not going to get much light into the bedroom. What is going to be overlooked from the neighbouring houses and the main house. And we have a set of double doors going onto an alley, which to me sounds like a huge security risk. It's going to be really vulnerable to breaking and entering. And we know those kind of double doors are often very easy to break through. So... I don't know if colleagues are as concerned as I am, but that seems really poorly designed to me. Uh, I'd like to ask a question also. If you go back to the um, floor plan, um, Appendix 2, you've got the size of the bedrooms, Unit one, uh, unit 2 and Unit 3, the square metres. Is, does that the square metres of the bedroom include the bathrooms? Without scaling off, I think it's without the. I think the en suites are are separate. Uh, the. I'm pretty sure it's such. It's without the. It's, it's without the en suites. So, so you're certain of that. Because unit three looks pretty, that 11 square meters look pretty tight. I think without uh, scaling it off, we can't give you a definitive answer, Chair, at the moment. Because uh, I'd like to um, add, if we don't get a definitive answer, because um, we need that, if, if they, these fall below the minimum standard, then they are failing, aren't they? But um, Steve Cox, Councillor Steve Cox. Could I propose that we have a site visit to, to go and look at, because I've, I've got concerns with, with back access as well. If bin storage, again, the bin storage is a massive issue, that it looks on Google Earth, not on scale, but it looks the bin access to rear doesn't look adequate to get a bin out that way. So if it ends up being an industrial sized bin, it's going to be permanently sited out there. Then we don't know. So it, to give, obviously, we need further clarity. And I think it'd be interesting, well, it'd be informative for us to go and actually have a look. Okay, well, waste and recycling, you know, don't offer the, the industrial sized bins to HMOs, it would be the, be the domestic ones, uh, first of all. Um, and uh, as, uh, as for room standards, the, this this being assessed by the Environmental Health Officer for potentially uh, licensing under the Housing Act, and, and they, they've checked off that does actually meet um, the, the standards. Um, so you've got the got the standard in the legislation with six and a half meters um, and the, the, the donks, basically the donks to standard for, for 10 for 10 square meters which uh, you know the you know that these do exceed councillor Steve Cox would you want to live there Mark well I mean it wouldn't be my not my first choice, but yeah, I don't think you have to answer that, Mark. But Irish speech. 
Yes, um, what I'm concerned about is the kitchen. I know it's 14 square metres, but I've counted the units and I know it's only indicative, and the six. If everyone had wanted a cupboard to put their own food and stuff in, there isn't enough, although more could be accommodated. But surely this amount of people, you have to have more than one cooker. Then there's a little matter of sink and, and you know, all that sort of thing. Uh, never mind, you know, doing the laundry. <laughs> we chilling, let's face it, we find in the laundry these days is pretty impossible. Um, so, so the thing is, I just think, frankly, I can't support it. To me, unit two, part of it in line with the blue line should be in unit one. And the rest of it should be in the communal areas because I think it's it's just needed. I mean, 15 square metres to sit down in if you've got eight people in at one time. I mean, I know it's highly unlikely to have everybody there. You know, they'd be falling over each other's legs. I just, just don't think it's... I don't think it's viable, is my comment. Thank you. Councillor Gary Stapleton, then Charlie Olga. Thank you, Chair. Um, I patiently sat and listened to all the comments re regarding the design and the layout, and personally, I'm really concerned about that. I, I trust the officers with what they're saying. Um, I know you've questioned it, and, and I'm willing to sort of be open to that. However, my, my concern is that every, it appears to me that every time a HMO comes to planning, it gets dragged into the front of committee, and I have concerns as the, the the motives for that, and I've got one question to the officer. This particular area, which I do not know, does it have a diverse cultural demographic? I'm not sure that's a material planning consideration for which we could take into consideration. So I'm, I'm not going to answer that because it's not a material planning consideration. I agree, it's not a material planning consideration, but I'm trying to get to the bottom of why everybody keeps objecting to HMOs. If we're meeting all the um, standards here and the material planning reasons are met, there still appears to be opposition. I, I've got my own opinion of what that opposition is, and, and I think there's people that are making huge assumptions about the people that are going to live in these properties, the same way as they make assumptions about antisocial behaviour. So that's the only reason for the question. I think, um, without wanting to go back over the history of why we've had an Article 4 direction and how it's come about, ultimately, um, the tenure of property, the affordability of property, the size of the property lends itself to conversion of uh, conventional dwellings to house of multiple occupation, HMOs. Um, the, the Article 4 was brought in because you could effectively convert these properties without requiring a formal planning application, providing that it met a certain threshold, so up, up to six people. The Article 4 prevents um, that permitted development change from taking place. So in effect, you have to apply for planning permission every time. That then is, should be read in conjunction with policy nine of the local plan. So again, kind of HMOs of have come into existence over the last 10, 15 years uh, in our previous iteration of our development plan. We didn't have a specific policy in relation to HMOs. We do now, as of September 2021. Um, so the development needs to be read in accordance with policy nine, the local plan. Um, now, I'll just touch on a couple of points in relation to sta uh, internal standards, because I appreciate that this is a, a concern for members. Um, policy 9 says that HMOs will only support, be supported where the internal standards of the property are suitable for multiple occupation. Now, what, what does suitable mean? So there's no definition within the local plan. So how would you determine whether it's suitable for accommodation? Well, what we've done is we've consulted with our environmental health team. So there are two parts to the HMO section. So there's planning permission, i.e. do you need planning permission or is it permitted development? Well, given the Article 4, we've established that it needs planning permission. The second part of that is a site license. 
So in every circumstance, it requires a site license. The environmental health team will assess the site license to determine whether it's suitable in terms of its size and internal standards. So we've used them as a benchmark to say, is this suitable for HMO conversion? Their advice to us is, yes it is. So it meets the standards. So in relation to policy 9A, we're content that it meets those required standards. Now, I, I appreciate the concerns, uh, Chair, from yourself in relation to, does it actually check out in terms of the measurements? And I, I can't be sure whether we're including uh, the WCs or not. So if there are concerns about kind of external storage and whether that uh, is sufficient, then I agree that as a cyber it would be the best course of action because it will enable members to go and have a look at that. It will enable us to effectively get the, the answers in terms of internal storage as well. So hopefully that's a comprehensive answer on a couple of points. Any follow-up questions? No. Charlie? Yeah, I agree with Steve, I think, to look at the big story. Because let's be honest, there's going to be 14 bins out there. No, there's only going to be three. Three? Yeah, because we only did today. Sorry, I'm on three. <laughs> three. No, Charlie, there's, there's only three. Because that's what the other three that would be necessary. Yeah, so, so it, it, it will... It will well, you wouldn't have a green one it will work on the same premise as a, as a conventional dwelling. So the, the residents could apply for additional bins, but it will work in the first instance like it would do as a, con a conventional dwelling. It may well be that they, they look at it and say, well, actually we need more capacity. But what, what that capacity means, we don't know, which is why we've got the condition on. So your space is only accounting for two bins. Because you don't need a green one, there's going to be a black one. Black blue. And a blue one, isn't it? Black yeah, one. so you, you, it's a green one, a black one, and a blue one, isn't it, yeah. Doncaster? So your green one is green waste, yeah, well, I assume. You have, you but you, green, well, you'd get one that, that is a standard, wouldn't you? Um, but you, you might not necessarily use it. You might then need additional capacity in relation to your cardboard and recyclable you know, domestic waste, so your black bin and your blue bin. I just, I just can't see how people can live in that with all... Because we know before they even start renting up bins, and the space outside is based on just two or three bins. Where you go to any property, and they all want one bin, at least one bin, per flat or apartment, whatever it is. And I just bear in mind, because it, the accommodation it is, they'll tend to be more rubbish because there'll be, you know, less likelihood of uh, cooking because you've got one cooker between them all, so it's more likely to be takeaways, waste. And, I do, and to sit outside, it's a lovely sunny day, and all the bins have been full of food waste for a week. Oh, my. No, because they've, they've got to wait a week. Mm -hmm. And you've got tickle ventilation going into unit two on the ground floor. Yeah, I just, no, I, I agree with Sam, it would uh, help to allay any fears. Well, can I, can I bring in um, Councillor Anderson? I would ask, when did we stop looking at waste uh, solutions in the planning application? We used to. We turned down an HMO probably three streets from here and had that decision upheld at appeal on the basis that we didn't think it could facilitate the number of bins required. Why are we now saying it's to be agreed later? I can understand that with things like drainage where it's a highly technical sub subject and mm -hmm. you know, we can't be expected to understand a drainage solution on a big site. Is there enough bin storage, and where is it, and is it going to work? That's something that's well within our capacity as planning uh, mm -hmm. members to understand. So, at what point did that policy shift come in? Yeah, it's it's not so much a policy shift as a much as uh, you've got to determine each application on its merits. 
Um, the, the application I think you're referring to was different in so much as it was a terrace property but didn't have any access to the rear. All the, all the bin storage was potentially on the frontage. This isn't the case here. We've got an alleyway to the back of the property and you've got 75 square metres worth of, uh, of space effectively to accommodate all of this. So it, it's, it's a different set of circumstances in which you would apply. So uh, as I said at, at the outset from, from this, we're confident that there's enough space in there to accommodate the level of bin storage needed in order to offset this development. Councillor Steve Cox. Can I propose a site visit again, please? Thank you. Yep. Um, shall we defer this um, till we have a. Uh, anybody's? You said 75 square metres. That can be used for bin storage. But it's not 75 square metres. Where's the cycle bay going to be? All right, Charlie, I, th I think a, a site visit would, uh, would like to propose a site visit Charlie, is seconded. All right, propose a deferred right, for a site visit. Can I just make sure that we've noted down the reasons for the site visit? So, from my notes I've taken, to have a look at the bin storage area, um, to look at the internal storage for each of the bedrooms. And I think, Councillor Anderson, you had some concerns about the outbuilding as well, so I presume you want that in added in there yeah. as well, if I missed anything. Can you put your red button on? Um, um, I'm not in concerned about Unit 2, that apart from those um, patio doors or whatever by the bed, um, to get into it, you've got to go into the living area to get into the unit. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'm concerned about that as well. Thank you. Good. Councillor Bob Anderson. Yeah, there's also the issues with the parking as well, isn't there? Because on page 23, you've put, given the type of accommodation, residents are less likely to have private transport. I'm not quite sure what you mean by that, but you're making the assumption that they won't all have cars, but there's a potential for nine cars and visitors. So with no private parking in place, that's, that's a lot of vehicles. Yeah, yeah, but, but in, in the report, it also says that it's permitted um, area. So they've got to uh, apply for parking permits. Um, but is it agreed that we're going to defer this now for a site visit? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I've got Councillor Cox moved it. Just need a second and then a few yeah. votes. Yeah, so Charlie O'Garth seconded it. Thank you. Can we have a vote? A vote for a site visit. Yeah, those against? A site visit? Any abstentions? One abstention? Yeah, that's agreed. Thank you. Right, we'll move on to application two. Planning application 22, uh, 23 forward slash double zero. 851 forward slash FUL, the construction of one new uh, what's that? dosing kiosk, dosing kiosk, and one sequential batch reactor motor control center, MCC kiosk and sewage works, Doncaster Lane, Woodlands, Doncaster. Anna Wilson, the planning case officer, will introduce the item. Anna. But just give it a minute till people vacate. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Chair. This application has been brought to committee because it represents a departure from the development plan being within green belt. The application seeks full planning permission for one dosing kiosk and one motor control centre and is recommended for approval. The site is located adjacent to the envelope of residential policy area for Ad Wheatley Street. There are agricultural fields surrounding it and a thick tree line 
around the site. The site is an operational site for Yorkshire Water and is currently in use. The proposal will upgrade the site and has a lifespan of approximately 15 years. The site has to renew equipment to stay up to current standards and support the growing houses in Doncaster. These photos show the aerial view of the current site and as you can see from this and the adjacent photo, the site is well screened from residential properties. These photos are from the entrance of the site and show that there are various items of equipment and buildings on the site and the proposed buildings will be no taller than these. This is a close-up of the tree line as well. So there you can see the buildings behind it which you couldn't see from the road. Um, this plan shows the internal layout of the site and as you can see the proposals will not affect the tree line and are well within the current site. The proposals have had no objections from consultees. There is no harm to highways with them being along the current access and the turning area not being affected. Environmental health have raised no objections being a significant distance from residential properties. There is no harm to agricultural land as it's within the current site. Ecology have raised no concerns but put con a condition on for construction environmental management plan. Um, the site is within flood zone two, but it's felt to be small scale development and will not add to flood risk and is sited on the highest parts of the land. Um, the site is also restricted locationally as it's an operational site and drainage have raised no objections subject to condition. The key consideration here is the green belt. Although the development is an operational site, it is within green belt and is considered inappropriate development requiring very special circumstances. However, the site is existing and the development is within the confines of the site. Thus you will have no significant impact on openness of the green belt and the benefits of improving water quality for the borough and improving provision given the rising number of houses. The proposal does not conflict with the joint waste plan and it will bring significant environmental benefits and reducing phosphorus and improving water quality. Ultimately, this is a plan in balance. Paragraph 8 of the MPPF indicates, amongst other things, that the planning system needs to contribute to minimising waste and pollution and mitigating and adapting to climate change, including moving to a low carbon economy. The proposal will have significant benefits to water quality and support housing. It's felt that very special circumstances have been proven given the benefits of the site's improvements and minimal harm to the Greenbelt's openness. Although a departure, it's felt that the benefits outweigh the harm. On your pre-committee notes, you will see that there is a speaker to speak, which is Jordan Guy acting as the agent. We've had additional information from drainage. However, internal drainage still feel that they want the conditions to ensure that they um, we've had an additional response from South Yorkshire Archaeology saying that there are no significant fines potentially on the site and there is an additional condition just to ensure that the colours are green to match the other buildings on the site. Although that's on their application form, um, it isn't noted on the plan so we've put a condition on to ensure it. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Mr. Jordan Guy, the agent, has requested to speak in support of the application. This is now your opportunity to address the committee for up to five minutes. Please press the large red button when you want to speak and press again to mute the microphone when you, you have concluded your submission. Would you like to commence? Thank you, Chair. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the case officer and all the consultees at Doncaster for their work in responding to this application. Um, as Hannah and the report explained, the proposed development is located within an existing site and developed site and will seek to improve the efficiency and water quality of Yorkshire Water's existing operations, connecting to and utilising the in in existing infrastructure that is also present on the site. Overall, the scheme will enable the existing wastewater treatment works to continue to operate and allow Yorkshire Water to meet its regulatory ob objectives to improve lo local water quality. 
As stated, the Countryside Officer views the proposal as in impacting on the openness of the Green Belt. Although it is agreed that this would be the case if the proposals were built as standalone units or if this was a new facility, however, it is argued that the openness has already been diminished by virtue of the existing site. The proposals would not further diminish, diminish this openness owing to the fact that they would be effectively screened within the existing site through surrounding vegetation uh, are designed to be no higher than the highest buildings uh, within the site and blend into, into the surroundings through their materiality to visually integrate into the existing wastewater treatment works and surrounding vegetation. Uh, more, moreover, as the Green Belt designation covers a wide area surrounding the wastewater treatment works, there is no other alternative location suitable that would avoid the Green Belt designation. However, as the countryside officer and case officer have deemed that the proposed operations do have a material adverse impact on the openness of the Green Belt, very special circumstances are required, which clearly, clearly outweigh any harm to the Green Belt. As agreed and stated by the countryside officer, the development is essential and vital infrastructure that is to enable Yorkshire Water to meet its obligations under, under the Water Infrastructure National Environment Programme as set out by the Environment Agency. It is intended to contribute to the overall improvements to the local water course. The development therefore has clear envi environmental benefits locally. The proposed development is being delivered by Yorkshire Water as part of their wider asset management plan investment proposals approved by the Water Services Regulation Authority, also known as Ofwat, uh, to improve infrastructure res resilience and quality for uh, local customers. The scheme as a whole will remove phosphorus from the treated effluent prior to entering the water course. Phosphorus removal from wastewater is essential to ensure the, the safety and health of the public and protect the environment. Elevated levels of phosphorus can be hazardous to local animal life. Following completion of the scheme, the work will in turn comply with the Water Framework Directive Phosphorus Consent Limit and improve wider water quality to the receiving water course of approximately 8.57 kilometres and additionally bring uh, significant environmental benefits and increase resilience from future flood and drought events and ongoing climate change. It is considered that should members deem that very special circumstances are required by virtue of the pro proposal impacting on the openness of the Green Belt, that very special circumstances do exist and are more than sufficient to justify the need for development and outweigh any harm that would be caused by their presence. Uh, we therefore my members to approve the application for the reasons stated above. Furthermore, the council and statutory consultees have no objection to the proposed development and recognize its wider importance. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I will now ask the com committee members if they wish to ask Mr Guy any question in relation to his submission. Councillor Steve Cox. Do we know how much phosphorus has been related, re released into waterways at this point in time? Uh, I'm not sure the exact uh, level, um, but the, the aim is to get it down to 0.3 milligrams per ton I think I'm not but it's um these regulations have been set by the environment agency it's nationwide um so we we Yorkshire Water have got a lot of um sites being upgraded at the moment and the main thing is to reduce the phosphorus I I, I don't know what, what yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot higher than it should be, yeah. Any more questions? All right, the committee members will now go into debate. Does any members wish to ask or comment on the report or ask the planning case officer a question? Iris Beach. Yes, um, it's really more, I suppose, for Gary. This is an application that I really don't know why it's come to us in that it's a, a building in an area that is already um, in use. It's not extra land. Um, I know it's in, in the green belt, but it's like a lump has been taken out of it, really. And I think that this is an application that, bearing in mind that isn't, this isn't a wish or a, 
a want. This is a necessity to have this this infrastructure put in. So I don't see why it actually come to us, and we should, uh, um, you know, it could have been done, you know, as, as officers. I think I think it's something we need to look at. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Beach. Yeah, um, the, the reason that it's come is because it's a, it represents a departure from the development plan. So um, I point members to paragraph, first of all, paragraph 149. Sorry, I'll, I'll row back a little bit. Paragraph 147 of the MPPF, which says, inappropriate development is by definition harmful to the green belt and should not be improved except in very special circumstances. Paragraph 149 sets out the exemptions so what, what is considered to be acceptable development within the green belt? This development doesn't fall with any of those exemptions, so is not in effect inappropriate development. The next stage of that is paragraph 148, which says when considering any planning application, local planning authorities should ensure that substantial weight is given to any harm to the green belt. And we've established that there's limited harm by virtue of impact on openness, uh, encroachment, those kind of things. So the five purposes of, of protecting the green belt. Green belt's got the highest order of protection. Um, but any harm, even limited, should be given substantial weight. The next stage of that is to look at whether there are any very special circumstances that outweigh that harm. Very special circumstances are slightly nuanced in that there's no silver bullet. You, you, you don't say, right, that's a very special circumstance, we'll use that. It could be a combination of factors that that cumulatively, uh, when added together, represent very special circumstances. And, and in this case, um, we've reached the conclusion that there are, by virtue of its limited impact, its visual, limited visual impact on openness, uh, and the combination of factors that it's going to improve effectively um, water uh, pollution. So th there are a number of factors, and as you'll have seen in the report, that when added together, we think are acceptable, but it, it's, a, it's a national prerogative that you've got to go through that balance and exercise and demonstrate that there are, in effect, very special circumstances that outweigh the planning harm. The thing is, it's on a site, and I don't think anybody will ever notice there's anything extra there. And to my mind, the, the other side of the equation is that you are doing benefit for the water courses. Which um, you know, which is what is, and we hear so often about loads of fishes dying and no no voles and all that sort of thing. Um, so, to me, the very special circumstance to me is the other side of the coin that you are doing good by putting this in. So you know, I know it's checks and balances, but thanks for that explanation. Councillor Gary Stapleton. Thank you, Chair. In the interest of debate, I have a question. You mentioned that the building will be green, the same as the existing building. Will it be the same shade of green? <laughs> Sorry. I think the condition does say to match the rest of the site. On my, uh... Thank you very much. No further questions, Your Honour. <laughs> Councillor Ogar. Yeah, can we just clarify? When this building or site is no longer used, needed at some time in the future, will it revert back to just being rebuilt with no permission? You know, there's no plans for it not to be needed, but as technology moves on, there may come a situation when suddenly. Oh, we've got this, we can build on it because we've already got it for this. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I mean, ultimately, what, what's been applied for is a full planning permission, so it's not a temporary consent. So in usual circumstances where a temporary consent is being applied for, you would have a condition at the other end of that to say, once it's come to the end of its life, uh, the building and or use shall cease uh, and the land should be put back to its previous use. Um, I don't think at this time there is a a known end date when that site will come to a, to an end. So it might be 15 or it could be 100 years time. Um, at this stage, what's been, what's been applied for is a, is a permanent uh, siting of that building. So uh, there's no necessity at this stage for us to impose a condition to say, remove upon uh, 
completion or cessation of those works, ultimately that land is is washed over by Greenbelt, as as is the majority of uh, the west of the borough. Um, and we wouldn't impose conditions on buildings that are washed over simply by Greenbelt, requiring them to, to be reverted back to an agricultural use. No, no more questions. Oh, sorry, Steve Scott. Councillor Steve Scott. It's just, again, in relation to this phosphorus, when, I mean, we, we've seen, and I do agree that it really, it, it did need to be here to a certain extent. But what concerns me is at what point did it trigger this this application to come in, bearing in mind that the applications have already gone for the pro for the properties around that that are being used by this plant. Surely it should have been this first and then the properties afterwards. Why did that not work that way? The site is 30 years old, um, so it needs constant improvement. A lot of it they can do under permitted development. They can't do this under permitted development. 50% um, of the scheme is required to maintain the current standard. Um, so I think it meets the current standard in some way, but they're continuously having to improve it. And that is happening, but unfortunately this requires permission. And they will continuously have to upgrade that site over years to meet standards because we're always improving our standards. I think it's a little bit of chicken and egg, if I'm being honest. Um, the, the developer, or Yorkshire Water, um, won't be fully aware of what will be coming on stream until it's eventually got planning permission. So do you build in capacity on the eventuality that something might get planning permission or might come forward. I think what, what they will have done is modelled on committed development, i.e. stuff that's got planning permission and is therefore likely to come forward over the intervening period, let's say till 2035. So they've looked at capacity and improvements and thought, right, we've now got a, a level of committed development that means we need to do something in order to maintain uh, service delivery. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Well, I mean, you know, Gary, that I, I constantly grumble about surface water and water running in, into waterways, and I mean, obviously, this is polluted. But you know, it, it's good to see something being done. And and what concerns me, and and what I have been saying for a long time, is that we should be looking at the the infrastructure and the maintenance of the waterways before these applications come in. Because, same as you said previously, we look at an application within the red line boundary, but the waterways don't stop there. Water, by nature, moves, and it affects all over the place. I can't find the route here for, for that water. So the, the potential of the, the contamination goes all over the place. And, yeah, absolutely welcome it, 100%. Mm. I'm just concerned that moving forward with other developments in other areas, they should be done the, the protection of the waterway should be done before the application comes forward, which is another one why it upsets me when we see the drainage information that isn't within the bundle that we see. So we do not know what's what's happening until after that application has gone forward. And we don't see an, any anything from it in way of contamination, storage, anything. So it's just a point, and you know, I, it, it does get to me a bit. Well, thank you. No, I, I, I take the, the point completely. I mean, coincidentally, uh, the council's validation checklist has been updated uh, within the last week. Uh, it's now up and uh, available on the council's webpage. It, it does go into greater detail in, in relation to drainage, so we are asking for more information up front. Um, previously and historically, we've asked for a lot of it to be done by a condition. And again, it comes back to an earlier point that it's, it's really it's a technical matter. So a lot of it can be dealt with by bone and control, uh, and a lot of it can be dealt with under a discharge of condition submission in collaboration with our internal drainage team and or Yorkshire Water where necessary. And, and there are kind of two issues at play there. There are surface water issues, which is water runoff from hard services, et cetera, and you've got foul drainage, which is uh, connectivity and capacity issues in relation to dealing with foul drainage. So um, what I would say, each application is judged on its merits in terms of it will go through that consultation exercise with 
seven Trent Yorkshire water internal drainage and the other drainage boards. Um, but there'll be other strategic higher level um, drainage strategies in, or, in order to deal with the, the city's uh, surface water and, and uh, viaducts and canals and rivers and dikes and all of those. So th there are kind of a lot of levels and, and layers to that. So um, yeah, I appreciate your comment, but we, we are doing something about it, hopefully. Right, thank you. And any more questions? Is there a proposal to grant planning permission subject to conditions? Is that seconded? Yeah. Irish Beach moves it and Gary Stapleton seconds it. Right. I will move to the to the vote. Please indicate by raising your hands four. Hands. And against, abstained. I think that's unanimous, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Application number three, planning application 23 forward slash 00769 COU, change of use from retail class E to adult gaming and amusement arcade. So generous at 37 Cleveland Street, Doncaster, DM1, 3DS. Susan Boyce, the planning case officer, will introduce this item. Susie. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so item three is a, an application for a change of use at 37 Cleveland Street. Uh, the application site is located in Doncaster City Centre. Uh, it comprises a vacant retail unit. It was previously a, an electronic vaping shop. Uh, it's been vacant for some time and the proposal is to change the use to an adult gaming and amusement arcade. The recommendation is for approval. Uh, the application has been brought to committee because it represents a departure from the development plan. An introduction to the site. Um, so the site here is at the corner of Cleveland Street and Kingsgate, which is the Waterdale Shopping Centre. It's got a frontage on each of those uh, sides. Um, so the current use as a, re as a well, the current vacant use uh, would be use class E. Um, the proposed use is for a uh, sui generis use as an amusement, an amusement arcade. Um, Neighbouring uses at the site, so there's Carter's Bar uh, at number 39 right next door, Foy's Solicitors above, um, opposite uh, at numbers 33 to 35 Cleveland Street uh, is Betfred. Uh, of particular relevance to this application, we've got Hayes Amusements uh, across the street at 14 Pals Close, which is in the colonnades. Um, and also nearby uh, is former Jackpot Amusements uh, on 46 Duke Street, which is now closed. And the reason I mention those is that they are both under the same ownership as the applicant, uh, the Hayes, uh, Hayes Amusements. Um, and as part of the proposal, it is proposed that the Gaming license from Jackpot Amusements is transferred to the new 37 Cleveland Street premises and that the Hayes Amusements Arcade at 14 Pals Close will close um, and move over into number 37 Cleveland Street. So the idea is essentially that it's relocating across the street. Just a few photos of the site. Uh, this is the unit being proposed for a change of use itself. You can see the frontages there at Cleveland Street and Kingsgate. Uh, and this, these are more photos of the surrounding area. So we've got the view there from Cleveland Street directly down into Kingsgate. We've got Betfred on the left there, Foy's Listers above, and the application site on the right. Opposite, we've got Hayes Amusements at 14 Pals Close in the colonnades. And there's Betfred again. So the actual proposal itself, uh, this is the site layout. Um, it shows a large open floor area with a change kiosk as well as a separate office, storeroom and toilet to, to the rear. 
There are no external alterations proposed. Uh, bin storage and collection arrangements will remain the same as existing, i.e. the uh, Waterdale Complex's uh, servicing area to the rear. Opening hours are to be Monday to Saturday, 9am to 10pm, and 10am to 9pm on Sunday. There have been no uh, objections raised regarding the proposed layouts, uh, the waste arrangements or opening hours. Um, the environmental health officer has confirmed that he doesn't have any objections to any potential noise uh, complaints arising. Uh, these types of uses don't tend, tend to generate adverse noise impact on neighbours. There aren't any residential uh, neighbouring uses uh, immediately adjoining either. Uh, one factor uh, which has uh, influenced the uh, intention to change the use of this unit is that the current premises at 14 Pals Close uh, has stairs to its uh, toilet facilities and it's understood that some of the patrons are having uh, difficulties accessing those um, in, in the instances of mobility issues. Uh, by contrast, the current 37 Cleveland, sorry, the proposed <laughs> Cleveland Street uh, premises has all the facilities on one level. Um, so it represents an improvement in that respect. Okay, main considerations. So why is this coming uh, to committee? These uh, essentially revolve around the principle of the change of use. Um, and the main issues that arise are to do with public health impacts and impacts on the city centre. So first of all, public health. Uh, the council's public health officer has objected to the proposal uh, on the grounds um, that uh, there is evidence links between harmful gambling and health inequalities, um, as well as a clear association between gambling at all levels of harm and increased alcohol consumption. Um, the count has a health needs assessment which has also made it clear that many of Doncaster's local services are supporting people with problem gambling um, and as such the proposal would therefore conflict uh, with strategic policy 50 of the local plan which seeks to improve and promote strong vibrant and healthy communities. Second um, in terms of the city centre uh, so the application site is located within the main city centre boundary. It's also designated as a primary shopping frontage on the adopted uh, local plan policies map. Policy 23 of the local plan emphasises that primary shopping areas uh, should be the priority locations for new and existing shopping facilities. Um, as an amusement arcade, this, this would uh, conflict with that. There's also a question to do with regeneration of the Waterdale Shopping Precinct. Uh, policy 67 supports proposals which revitalise the Waterdale Shopping Centre as a predominantly retail-led mixed-use development, uh, which is complementary to the existing provision in the city centre. So if we delve a bit further into uh, policy 23, uh, which is the particularly pertinent one here. So part three of policy 23 specifically re relates to betting shops, amusement arcades, payday loan units, and pawnbrokers. Those are grouped together because they uh, can lead to impacts on the vitality and viability of a town centre um, and where, where there are instances of proliferation or over-concentration. So policy 23 uh, requires that such uses uh, will only be supported where it can be demonstrated a that the property has been vacant uh, and or has been marketed unsuccessfully successfully for at least one year um, and the rent value has been set at a realistic rate b the new use would generate footfall within the shopping frontage and c there is no clustering or cumulative impact resulting from an over concentration of such uses in an area and clustering will occur where more than 10% of units in a parade of ma main town centre uses uh, will be used. In terms of points A and B, these are satisfied. The unit has been long-term vacant um, and its return to an active use would generate footfall within the shopping frontage. So we turn to point C. So in terms of the parade of shops against which this, policy, this application is measured, 
Uh, this could either be taken as units 30, uh, 37 to 47 Cleveland Street, outlined in blue on the plan here, uh, five units in there. Or, and it's a slightly funny one here because it's connected at the first floor level, you could also consider it as uh, comprising those additional two units where Bet Fred is as well. Either way uh, that you look at it, the proposed use would introduce uh, more than 10% of such uses into the parade. Uh, so either 20%, 1 in 5, or about 29%, 2 in 7. So this represents a technical breach of policy 23, part 3C. In terms of proliferation, there were also some concerns because in addition to the proposed unit, there's also Betfred immediately across Kingsgate, there's also the Hayes Amusement Unit immediately opposite in the colonnades, 14 Pearls Close. Now it's proposed that that uh, premises shuts um, when the 37 Cleveland Street, before the 37 Cleveland Street use opens. There were concerns that um, because the lawful planning use of that Pearls Close unit would remain, whether or not Hayes Amusements were in there or not, another operator could come along open it up and then we'd have three uh, betting shops or similar uses within a stone's throw of each other uh, in a sort of diagonal um, triangle across Cleveland Street there. However, um, 14 Powers Close is in the council's ownership and therefore whilst the lawful planning use would remain, the council has the power to refuse to let it to another such operator and to let it instead to um, but for some other use that would be appropriate in the town centre. That would require, well, may potentially require planning permission to do so, but the council has control um, to prevent another gambling operator from, from setting up in there. Um, so that does, so whilst that's not a, a, a technical um, aspect of policy 23, it, it, it's pertinent to the uh, impression of proliferation um, in that area. Uh, yeah, yes, the um, in terms of closing 14 Pals Close, the applicant has also committed to signing a legal agreement uh, covenanting not to open 37 Cleveland Street until Hayes Amusements in 14 Pals Close has closed. Uh, so the recommendation um, is to approve subject to that legal agreement. Uh, the final consideration in terms of the impact on the city centre also relates to the impact of the proposals on the regeneration of the Waterdale shopping precinct. Uh, so policy 67 does seek for this to be retail led um, and there were concerns that the proposed use would introduce essentially two betting uses at a key gateway into the shopping centre. Um, there is a material benefit in terms of it would uh, bring a vacant unit back into active use. It would vacate one in the colonnades immediately opposite. Um, on the whole, it's concluded that the impact in terms of policy 67 is essentially neutral. You're uh, bringing one back into active use um, whilst return making another one empty. Um, the council's policy officer did uh, request that if the application be granted um, that a condition be attached to the uh, decision notice requiring details of an active frontage um, to ensure that there are visual and material improvements um, to the shopping precinct. Uh, we do have a mock-up um, of, of that frontage. This is, this is just indicative at this stage though, um, and the details would be approved uh, by discharge of conditions application. So bearing in mind those considerations, uh, we come to the planning balance. Um, the application proposal it does represent a technical breach of local plan policy 23, 
regarding the proliferation of gambling uses within the parade of shops on this side of Cleveland Street, um, and policy 50 uh, in terms of public health impacts uh, which arise from the gambling use. Um, there are also questions about the impact um, on city centre regeneration aims for the Waterdale precinct, but it's concluded that the uh, impact is largely neutral in that respect. Um, however, the proposal essentially involves the relocation of an existing business from one side of the street uh, to the other um, into premises which just better caters for uh, its, its patrons. Um, three key factors weigh in favour of, of the proposals that the council have control over who the vacated Pell's Close unit is let to, um, that a legal agreement can be secured to ensure that the 37 Cleveland Street premises doesn't open until 14 Pell's Close unit closes. Um, and finally, um, it's worth bearing in mind that there would be no net increase in the number of adult gaming and amusement arcades in the immediate vicinity. Um, 46 uh, Duke Street, which is where Jackpot Amusements is around the corner, um, if that, I mean, that is now closed, it could reopen in a, uh, be, be reopened by another operator. Um, so we've either got four similar uses becoming free uh, or remaining four. Um, overall, no increase. So, uh, to conclude, uh, the application is recommended to committee for approval, subject to a legal agreement and uh, conditions. Uh, the conditions uh, are detailed in the agenda um, report. Uh, these cover a time limit, uh, plans, and the active frontage uh, condition. I think that's everything. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, we have one speaker in support of the application, uh, Charles Hayes, the applicant. Thank you, Susie. Yeah, Charles Hayes, the applicant, has requested to speak in support of the application. This is now your opportunity to address the committee for up to five minutes. Please press the large red button when you want to speak and press again to mute the microphone when you have concluded your submission. Thank you for the opportunity. <clears throat> if I could first explain, there had been a misunderstanding of our plans to relocate our current operating premises to a new location. And initially, Public Health and Doncaster Planning were of the understanding that we were applying to expand our business, which we are not. However, after clarification of our intentions, Doncaster Planning now understands that we are in fact downsizing our operations. By closing two premises, and relocating to a single location at 37 Cleveland Street. I'm unsure whether the Director of Public Health is fully aware of this. My family have been operating arcades in Doncaster for over five decades, beginning with my grandfather, continuing with his sons, and now in the hands of myself under the guidance of my father. Over these years, we have been fortunate enough to see a loyal local community develop. Currently, after closing a secondary establishment at 46 Duke Street, we are now operating from one premises at 14 Pals Close. Our intention being to relocate across the road to 37 Cleveland Street to make use of more accommodating facilities for our aging customers. My family have been heavily involved in the development of our small business throughout its entirety and continue to have a known presence in the local community. A member of our family is always either present on the arcade floor or at hand to be called in by staff. We are heavily involved with our customer base. The majority of our patrons are elderly and disabled and seek Hayes Amusements as a social and safe environment familiar with our business and family. We care for our community, many of which we consider family friends and place their social and economic health above all and are incredibly aware of the role our business plays in their social lives. This is primarily why we're having to relocate. The toilet facilities at our current premises are inaccessible to many of our customers, as there are 28 steps to the toilet facilities. We are committed to continuing to serve our loyal community, but we're unable to do so at our current location. The new unit that we're hoping to move to is just 20 meters away, 
and it has fully accessible ground floor toilets. This will enable our loyal customer base to move with us and to maintain the social atmosphere that they enjoy. Our motivation for this move is accessibility for our patrons, but this also extends to my own family. My daughter, who we hope to have working in the family business, is a wheelchair user and is not able to access our current facilities. In the hope of continuing to have our family serve the local community, we must become more accommodating for the disabled and elderly, and this relocation would allow us to do just that. Unlike many large and impersonal gaming establishments, our unique relationship with our patrons allows us to better to care for their welfare, allowing us to check in when we notice unusual or distressing behaviour and to moderate their spending habits when we notice anything of concern, something that large corporations are simply unable to do by nature of the relationship between the owners and the customers. Two large gaming companies in prominent positions in Doncaster operate 24-7 which we consider dangerous to our customer welfare. Our operating times are limited from 9am to 9pm. We feel that by closing at such a time, it will prompt our customers to care for their well-being and health needs. We are one of the founding members of BACTA, which is a British Amusement Catering Trades Association, our governing body, and ensure that we undergo regular staff training and remain up to date with the Gambling Commission's latest policies and procedures. As a further reflection of our family's One minute remaining. Sorry. As a further reflection of our family's character, my father, Charlie Hayes, has two commendations from Doncaster Police for services to the community, a dedication that I hope to continue. Finally, if I can just clarify that the new premises at 37 Cleveland Street will not open until our present premises at 14 Pells Close ceases to trade. It is not our intention to operate two similar businesses in close proximity to each other. This would not make any financial sense. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I will now ask the committee members if they wish to ask Mr Hayes any question in relation to his submission. I, Irish speech? No? Bob Johnson? Councillor Bob Johnson? Hi, why, why are you actually closing the 14 Pells close and then moving to 37 Cleveland Street? It's because of the toilet facility primarily. Is it a bigger premises? Uh, what, 14 Pells close or the 37 Cleveland Street? It, 37 Cleveland Street, sorry, is it, it a big... It's not a bigger premises, no. It's on the ground floor, uh, it's fully wheelchair accessible. But 14 Pells close, the unit we're closing, has got two flights of 14 steps. And it's on two levels, two floors. Um, just another question. You said you moderate how your customers spend money, and that's how do you do that? Uh, we build a player profile. We get to know our customers. We talk to them. Uh, we ask them what they do for a living. And you build up a player profile, and you can assess what they can and what they can't afford to, you know, to spend. Um, so that, that's the answer to that, really. Yeah, because I have seen elderly people lose everything in these gaming establishments. So, through personal, it's not me, but family members. Right. I'm sorry so, to hear that. Yeah. So, there's a lot of pubs within that vicinity, isn't there? So, you're looking, obviously, to attract that clientele as well. No, sir, we're not. We're already at the corner of Kingsgate there. We have a pub next door to us and a pub adjacent to us. Uh, so we're... But there is other pubs within close vicinity as well, isn't there? There's one in the Waterdale, one a bit further down. Yes, sir, there is, yeah. there is pubs there, but we don't allow anybody to come in the establishment intoxicated. We have a duty of care, and we, we take that seriously. Like I say, we're, we are the owners and operators. Right. Thank you. Councillor Beach? Yes. Pardon me, but I know nothing about gambling. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll try and teach you. No, 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 thank you. <laughs> um, Bet Fred... As happens, quite yes. accidentally, I've passed that, come up through that area today. Um, and met Fred and the proposed um, place you want, which is under the solicitors, isn't it? That's correct, yes. Yeah. Um, there are different types of, are there different types of the, um, I think of Bet Fred as backing on the horses, that yes, sort of that, thing. that's correct. Whereas, according to the design on the screen, it looks like it's, is it terminals for electronic bingo or that sort of thing? It, it's... Regarding ours, it's fruit machines. 
oh. uh, you know, slot machines where you press the start button and then the reels come in. I've been to Vegas. <laughs> no, I lost a tenner. <laughs> where where bet, bet Fred is primarily it's it's bookkeeping. You can bet on, I believe, anything. Oh. Uh, but I, th I think they have four uh, B3 machines, so they can have four machines in there. Thank you. Thank you. I've never been in a, never been in the bookies, but although I've been to Vegas. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bob Anderson. What sort of limits can people spend on these machines? Uh, primarily, um, well, for a maximum, it's £2 per play. So it's £2 per spin. But 80% of our arcade is 10p play. We believe in giving customers value for money and staying in for a long time. It, it is, in a sense, buying entertainment. Uh, I mean, I went to Clumber Park uh, to take my daughter for a walk on Sunday, or a wheelchair push, I should say, and uh, it cost me £15 just to get into Clumber Park. I think the prices of things today are just very expensive. Yeah, but you're going somewhere for your money, aren't you? You're not putting it in a machine and losing it all. That That's correct, but I can... Sorry. Uh, Sorry, Sorry if, if I just may say, you know, people do enjoy themselves. It's, it's a very social thing. We have old ladies that, that come in and talk to us and talk to each other. They go get their hair done. It's very social. And I think if they were to stay at home, well, they would probably get very depressed. I understand what you're saying, but you're painting a great picture of it all. And the reality is with gambling for a lot of people is totally different to the picture you're painting. I totally understand what you're saying. I'm, I'm just telling you, that, you know, I've worked in the arcade since I was 16 years old. I'm now 52 years old. And uh, we treat our customers with respect. And like I said, we have a duty of care. And if we see anything, any problem gambling, we step in, we talk to them, give them time out. They can even ask to self-exclude. We're happy to do that. We have policies and procedures in place to stop, you know, gambling becoming a problem. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions from the panel? No. All right, we'll move into the committee members will now go into debate. Does any member wish to comment on the report? or ask the planning case officer a question. Uh, we've got Charlie Ogarth and then Gary Stapleton. Yeah, I, I support this uh, proposal and I think it can go well. My only concern is where it keeps going. The council can refuse to let somebody have rent that to be premises on Pell's Plot. Excuse me, Charlie, sorry for interrupting. Can you turn your mic off? I'm terribly sorry. Thank you. Yeah, the council can refuse to let the uh, premises to a similar thing, similar activity. But the council's selling a lot of property. If it sells that property on Pell's Close, can we still refuse? Or has it still got a gambling license? Or uh, what it's called? Uh, as it stands at the moment, it's within the council's ownership. So you're right, we, we do have a, it's within the council's gift, so to speak, to uh, prevent or restrict future operation of that site. It will remain in place that it's a lawful uh, use, so it's the planning use that could operate for that. But given that it's in the council's ownership as it stands, then we could prevent other uh, similar uses from going in there, or it would have to be the same because of the, the nature of it being sewer generous. Um, I would imagine if the council came to dispose of that site, then it could impose a covenant on the sale of it to prevent it being used for its particular use, which would in effect mean or trigger the need for a planning application to change it. But they don't have to put a condition on it if they sell it. We can just sell it with no condition. So saying that, yeah, it can no longer be used for gaming. That's not really in the council's uh, remit because business, you know, council is a business and it's sort of like where we're going to make up, you know, they've offered us this amount of money, why should we uh, you not know, accept it? Yeah, they, they could do, but they wouldn't because they've signed up to it. So our assets department are fully alive to the fact of why we've recommended planning permission should be granted for this site of 37 and are signed up to the fact that they can't then dispose of that site either by renting it to an alternative use or by selling it for the same use. So everybody's signed up to the fact that 
it won't be coming forward as a as an amusement arcade. So they could do, they just won't. Irish speech. I'm talkative today. Um. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt you, Iris. It, it, Gary Stapleton were coming in. Councillor Gary T Stapleton after Charlie. Sorry about that. I'll bring okay. you in after you. Gary. Thank you, Chair. Um, at the beginning of this session, I thought this would be a really quick <laughs> thing. It isn't. Um, and I've, I've got quite a bit to say on this, um, as normal. Um, Whilst I do understand and I do empathise with anybody that, that's got family members that have had issues with gambling, and I genuinely do, I'm very disappointed with this stance that public health are taking. Because if they applied this to other industries, for first of all, your race course is gone. Doncaster without a race course, never in a million years. Also, no McDonald's. No pubs, no shops, because everything harms in, in, when, when you overindulge. So I think public health's stance on this is, as far as I'm concerned, it has no weight whatsoever. Um, now, I, I am going to support this fully. There's a couple of other things I want to say. I'm going to support it fully because I remember going, believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, I remember going to the marathon gym. Not to work out, just to meet people, you know. But, um, and and Hayes's amusement was part of my childhood, and it's been there for years and years, and it, it needs to remain as as part of Doncaster's culture in some form. Now, as to the the moves, and uh, you know, it's like what may happen with the the the, the building that we're about to locate. Well, it's Doncaster Town Centre, so I'm sure Gary Welsh will open another one of his stores because he seems to have quite a flip few in Doncaster at the moment. Um, the, the, the Talking about the, the gateway to the Waterdale, well, anything that improves that gateway, because as soon as you go past it, it looks like a bomb site from World War II. And we're talking about development, well, it's not even the council, so it's not within the gift of council to develop the site anyway. So anything that, that improves it. And I did actually notice as well that we're talking about no net increase. No, we're not. We're talking about a net decrease in the number of gambling establishments there. Uh, whilst everybody else is looking at the watch, I rest my case, Your Honour. Okay. Yeah, um, this, this is exactly the point of debate, obviously, to it's not only to ask questions to officers, but to express opinions about why they're supporting an application or not. Um, ultimately, uh, I take your point in relation to harm. Um, yes, there are other uses that have the potential to create harm. Um, that's why we have policies. The policies then dictate what you should be doing in order to kind of mitigate that harm or, or offset it. Uh, and importantly, on this, in this case, you've got policy 23, part three, which looks at trying to prevent uh, that proliferation of uh, uses within a particular area or a proximity of an area. Um, I think Susie set out quite concisely in the report uh, the reasons why we're supporting it. And again, in the presentation, um, ultimately, it's a it's a balance and exercise um, with the emphasis on looking at planning harm. Uh, and I think if the situation had been different in so much as the council didn't own uh, the colonnade site at 14, then I think the recommendation would potentially have been different because the council, it isn't within the council's gift therefore to control it. We can't make somebody else come in and put a planning application in to change the use and we can't tie anybody into a section 106 agreement or a unilateral undertaking to make that or, or alter that use. So it, it's a unique set of circumstances, this, um, which has enabled us to, to take, I would say, a common sense approach to the fact that you've got um, acknowledged Betfred on the other side of the road, you've got a vacant use and you've got an existing use. Um, and it's simply moving one, in simplistic terms, moving one across the road. So in terms of planning harm, you're right, there's no net increase, and that's that's the important part of the of the policy, is, is kind of looking at the, the cumulative effect or the proliferation. And I think a, a common sense approach is that it's effectively one for one. Um, so on balance, whilst it's slightly elevated in terms of its 
um, and Susie touched on this point very eloquently in a presentation, it, it's elevated in terms of its uh, percentage than we would normally expect. The unique set of circumstances for this application mean that we, it's one that we're, we're happy to, to kind of accept. Thank you. I'd like to bring in Iris Beach. Thank you. Um, I would say that it's just certainly not a pro proliferation. If anything, it's minus one, the area, because of course there was four in the first place and now they've got, you know, reduced. Um, what my question really is about the licence. They've closed a jackpot and they intend to move this premises, use the other side of the road. So they've had two licences. Can one just be transfer the one and the other one actually be cancelled um, so that we get out of this situation where someone who where we don't control the premises uh, you know could just walk in and open something else um, testing my knowledge now on other legislation um, I, I don't know what the if I'm being completely honest I don't know what the procedure would be to cancel a license but but nevertheless the lawful planning use wouldn't change regardless of whether it had a license or not. So it, it would still remain the fact that the, the only mechanism the council's got, um, and th this comes back to a point Council Hogarth made, which is about the kind of security about making sure that one closes before the other one opens, is this unilateral undertaking, the legal agreement that effectively means that um, the site operator and the council are tied into this agreement to say, we're going to close that one before we open that one. Can I could, but if I close any, I mean, it could could it close one on Saturday and open the other one on Sunday type of thing? It, it still fulfills the legal agreement because I, I was just thinking, you know, if if it is sort of used as a sort of social area for uh, people, then they toddle up one morning, oh, you know, where am I going to go? <laughs> so uh, you know, th that was what I was. Yeah, uh, just further in terms of the gambling licences, um, I may not have mentioned it in my presentation, the licence at £14 close is due to expire in March 2024 um, and so the, I think the intention is to uh, close it around then and open the 37 Cleveland Street so that would have expired um, fairly shortly. Just just an addition to that, uh, without wanting to do Mr. Hayes's business for him, uh, I would imagine that it would be a, a lot to do with communication for his patrons about we've got planning permission if members are minded to grant planning permission today. We've got planning permission. We intend to open on such and such date. This will be closing on X date. Please be aware that it will no longer be open from yes and go across the road. But again, that's ultimately a decision for Mr. Hayes. Councillor Cox. Could I move to grant this? Please. Yeah. Yes. Um, there's a uh, is there a proposal to grant? Uh, planning permission subject to the conditions and completion of section 26 agreement and the head of planning to be authorised to issue the planning permission upon completion of the legal agreement. Is there a mover for the recommendation? Councillor Cox. Is that seconded? Gary Stapleton. I will move to a vote. Please indicate by raising your hand. Four. Against? Any abstentions? Yep. I can confirm that's been agreed. Yep. Thank you very much. Right. Um, Item six, appeals decision. This report is for information only. Does any member wish to speak on this item? No. Right, can I ask committee members to move that? It is to the report to be noted. Noted, thank you very much. Right, before we move on to the, um, item seven, I propose that we have a, a comfort break. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it, so, yeah, so what time is it now? Five to, if we're back in here at five past.
Yeah. Ten minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. See, see you in ten minutes. I think we're all present. Item seven: Doncaster Local Heritage List Adoptions. Malcolm Thomas, Design and Con Conservation Officer, will introduce the item. Malcolm. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Some of you might remember, um, if you were on the planning committee earlier this year, I, um, I spoke about this on the, it was actually the 7th of February, I remember it well, it was my birthday. Um, it, the 7th of February is when I spoke about this uh, and told you about where we'd got to with the local list. Uh, so the, the, the point of this visit really is to tell you what we've done since and to, you know, to note the fact that we've now got an up and running heritage list, local heritage list, but also to and, and, uh, and to tell you what this means, but also um, where you can find more about this, how you know, and, and really sort of what this list is all about. So I apologise if I sort of say this, if I'm going to go over some ground that you might be aware of uh, from earlier this year. But uh, just to very briefly give a background to the local list, um, this was going back several years. This was a, a, well, the local list. What is a local heritage asset? It's basically, um, well, we, you might be aware of listed buildings, conservation areas, scheduled monuments, and so on. But there is a whole host of other historic structures, buildings, uh, what we call heritage assets, that don't fit into those. Uh, and rather than somebody saying, is it a listed building? No, OK, can I knock it down then? Um, rather than somebody saying that, it's more about the continuum of um, heritage assets, starting from you know, small you know, even houses and conservation areas, building up, building up. The, it's, like I said, it's a continuum, but it's only those at that end of it that's got any heritage status. Conservation areas, listed buildings, parks and gardens, uh, scheduled monuments. Uh, in the NPPF, it talks about undesignated heritage assets. Those are the things that... Um, don't have statutory protection, but they, st they still count as heritage. It's sort of like the fabric that's around us, really. Um, now, a few years ago, the government, uh, as the government does from time to time, gives out some money uh, uh, to do various projects. One of these projects was for South Yorkshire to produce a local heritage list. South Yorkshire Archaeology got all of us all of us conservation officers in South Yorkshire together, which itself is rare, but got us all together and said, right, what do you think of the idea of producing a heritage list for South Yorkshire? Um, <clears throat> we persuaded the senior managers that this was a good idea. It's in our local plan, we said. Uh, you know, we said we're going to do this. Here's a chance to do it. Otherwise, it would just stay in aspiration, perhaps forever. Um, so with this money, we had a project officer and... and uh, set up a website whereby people could nominate. The project officer went around the various authorities, talking to individual groups and so on, and tried to encourage them to nominate heritage assets for the local list. Um, there were certain criteria that had to be met. Then there was a panel of people who have some knowledge of heritage, people who had heritage expertise. And that's one of the good things about this. It's not just a conservation officer going, I think that's a heritage asset. It was a panel of people who were able to bring their own expertise to it and say, yes, that's worth uh, being a heritage asset. Out of that, we had, we had a starting list of 31. Um, and there's more in the pipeline. There's actually a lot more coming through uh, over the next few months or so. Um, <clears throat> bear in mind, this is the first time we've ever done such a thing. So the process is sort of fairly slow and laborious. It's taken us a while to get here, but I think we've done something that's quite good, and we, I think we've been very thorough about it as well. Um, when I was last year, I said that we were going to um, go out to consultation. There's been, to get on the local list, there's one set of consultation anyway, like a South Yorkshire consultation, because um, before those assets go to the panel, they, they spend six weeks out there inviting comments about them or further um, uh, you know, further information to be sent in and so on. Now, so, that, that, so there's already one phase of consultation, but we were told, look, for Doncaster, you're going to have to go through a second phase as well. 
So that's what I reported on, on in February. And so that's what we did. The 31 that we'd got ready, we then went out and consulted the people who owned them. Um, you know, well, I think we, I think we sent a, a, a notice to all the ward councillors and so on. We went through a, this, sort of, this consultation process. And out of that, we got um, three objections or three cases where there's a little bit of co controversy about it. So what we decided to do there, uh, we decided to press ahead with the 28 where we didn't get any responses or didn't get any, whether a positive response or not a response. We thought, well, these can be heritage assets now. The other three, I think we will probably invite further comment on them. We'll pro I think the, the, what we're gonna do is to invite um, those who objected, can you support your objection with evidence? Uh, and, and likewise, those who uh, want them to be heritage assets, you know, can you add any, basically, another sort of set of consultation? I think that's only fair. Um, <clears throat> so we've, now, we've got 28. Uh, we ended up with 28 as a result. And they are, um, they're at the back of, uh, <clears throat> I think we've got, um, there we are. Doncaster Local Heritage List consultation report. They're at the back of there. The, th the three that didn't make it are in red at the back of this. Oh, really? Uh, oh, that's, sorry then. It, it, I think, uh, oh, it must, yes, it, I think they, we sent it as a link rather than as a, as, we didn't send it as an actual paper. I think we were told to cut down on paper or to try to sort of not, if there are links to the web, to use those instead. Point is, there are 28 of, out of 31 got through. Um, <clears throat> it tells you, these things are also on our, on our website. There is a web page in conservation called Locally Listed Heritage Assets. And it goes through all these mm -hmm. things. It goes through the process that we've been through. It goes, the... The consultation report is on it, um, and there is also a link to the heritage map on it as well. So you can actually locate where these things are and uh, find out more about them. So our 28 then, um, that's, that's our, the start of our local heritage list. Um, <clears throat> we could, what does this mean? What it, what, it mean, it's, what it means is that it obviously they're not the same as listed buildings or conservation areas and so on. What we ask for the, the, the buildings at any rate is that their special interest, their character then becomes a material consideration in any planning application, which is uh, where, where you come in. So if you are faced with a planning application where the, one of them is a local heritage asset, I think it's local plan policy 40 applies. And awkward, because actually, if it's archaeology, it doesn't cover archaeology, but there we do have a, a separate archaeology policy anyway. So that policy would apply, and you, know, you would need to look at that policy. And it asks you to take what's called a balanced view. Is what's in front of you, um, is the proposal you're facing, if it's harming the heritage asset, is that harm outweighed by the benefit of that proposal? That's, what you'd be, that's what's meant by a balanced judgment. Um, it doesn't mean that uh, a heritage asset can't be changed, altered, or anyth anything like that. It's not the same as a listed building. Otherwise, they would be listed buildings. Um, to be honest, one or two of these, we might submit uh, to Historic England and say, you know, these are worth looking at. These are, some of the Doncaster ones are very good quality. It might be worth looking at them, but that's not for us to decide. So that's what um, a local list, that's what a, a local list heritage asset means. Key things to understand, one, they're not necessary buildings. Um, they could be archeology, span or in the case of the ones that might be coming up in a, a couple of months or so, they could be areas like sort of um, an area that's sort of a little bit below status to a conservation area. You know, it could be an area of special interest, for example. So that's what it means. So the list has been signed off by a senior officer. That's how it be becomes um, a local list. 
And then there is also a process for adding to the local list. Um, the, way we, the way our local list works would be to nominate through the South Yorkshire, uh, we've still got this South Yorkshire process up and you know, it's still working. We've lost our, um, we've lost our project officer because the money runs out. Um, and you know, we, we've put a little bit of funding to keep some, the website going. So the website, website is still active. So to submit a heritage asset, you use that South Yorkshire web, uh, website. It then goes to the panel who assess it. And if it's worthy, we would then go through the same process, the consultation process. Um, it's taken us a while because there are lots of little things to sort out, like um, the boundary. It's, it's important to understand the boundary of these heritage assets. And it's taken us a while to get the boundaries uh, done very clearly, working with our GIS officers and so on. Because um, <clears throat> at the moment, in, with, with South Yorkshire, they're just points. They're just sort of dots around South Yorkshire. So we've worked on making them uh, into areas. And we've worked on providing the information for them as well on our website. So I think I've covered more or less where we've got to today. Um, I'm not sure, I, I don't think I've got any more. I think I've covered the basics there. So if there are questions, I'm happy to answer them. Councillor Beach. A couple of things, Malcolm. Mm. First of all, um, at our last planning application, we uh, passed a, an mm. application for Coltrane Mill in mm. uh, Mexborough. Um, is that likely to be out? I mean, it's been saved, and it because a previous application floundered, uh, it would have been gone by now. So, is that going to be able to be added? Uh, well, just to answer that question, um, that's an interesting one. It's actually a good one to bring up because the Coltrane Mill was something that was uh, added at the last minute. Uh, it, was, it was put to me that this could be a local heritage asset and uh, I asked for them to, to be submitted to the South Yorkshire list. And what we did is we brought the meeting for, or rather we brought the Coltrane, we sort of bumped it up so that we could assess it before the, um, the planning application, before it came to committee. Um, it was a little, it, it was done informally, so we can't call it a proper uh, assessment, but the view of the Heritage Committee was that it was worthy of local mm -hmm. listing. That was their, you know, that was their recommendations. Uh, so my view is that it'll go forward as such, and it'll be on one of the, ne one of the next, um, tran probably the next tranche or so mm. uh, of local list structures. It'll be on that. Mm. Our recommendation was, yes, it's worthy of local listing. Uh, and just another thing is, can you make sure that we do get a list, I mean, not that I can think of anything that's good, but, but that we get a list, particularly you know, for the local councils, that they know what the situation with them with the buildings in their area, mm. so that uh, you know, because nothing's worse than being being asked something and you don't know anything about mm. it. Well, yeah, um, the list is in the the actual list is in the local plan um, website. What I could do is at the end of this submit um, send the same mm. things the actual electronic copies over so they can be printed. Um, yeah, it, it's not, yeah, I think we've printed one of them. It's not ideal that you don't have the list, but yeah. Mm. Sorry, I was thinking of anything that is uh, going to be coming up. That, oh. Um, I mean, the, 20, the, the ones that, 30, 31 original ones mm. we've got listed, but as they come forward, um, mm. you know, we it, it's as well for for the local council. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, what, what I would say is that this whole process, I think the way I would think of this year is it's our first run through of the process. And I know, for example, that uh, you know, in, the communication side of it is not great, especially since we lost our project officer. Um, and our Bawtree 
a heritage group, for example, have got, you know, they, they, they complained that they submitted these buildings or they made submissions but didn't know what had happened to them. So, yeah, I think this is something that we'll need to think about is the, the communication side of it. It's one of the things we've learned this year in, in, in the way to do the process. But the, the critical thing is we now have a list and the list can be added to. Gary? It, it might be a point for me to take away. Uh, I, I get it totally where you're coming from. It's, it, it's slightly, it's not, it's not a static list. That. So there will be things that come onto the list that haven't previously been onto it. So um, as Malcolm says, it might well be a communication thing. Uh, I'm more than happy to have a discussion with the policy manager outside of this to look at whether we do something like an annual report that's circulated to members so you can see what's come on the list in the next, over the past year. Uh, and that might give you a, a kind of up-to-date picture. What I don't want to do is create an industry of it and you, you constantly get in, inundated with one and two and three that have come onto the list. It might be just good to, to take stock at the end of a year and just say, this is the, these are the changes that have taken place. Yeah, I mean, we don't need to have that which we've already got. We just need any additions, be it three or another 30. Can you use the microphone? S say the Coltrane Mill is on the next one, knowing that that's up and coming, uh, and knowing which buildings and areas and so on is up and coming. No, that's fair enough, and that, that's something I'll feed back to the team manager. Any more questions? N no? All right, can I ask the committee members, uh, note the uh, contents of the report and note the newly adopted Doncaster Local Heritage List, which compromises the 28 heritage asset listed in Appendix 2 of the Doncaster Local Heritage List Consultation Report will now be a material consideration in any planning application that affects them. Do we agree? Noted. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on to item 8, Doncaster Council, adoption of supplementary planning documents on flood risk developer and technical requirements, loss of community facilities and open space and local labour agreements. Chris Hall, Principal Planning Officer, will introduce this item. Chris. Thank you and uh, good afternoon. Um, just here to update you briefly on the um, adoption of the four new supplementary plan documents which um, Councillor Farmer has just uh, mentioned. Um, so since the local plan was adopted, we've been working on developing um, supplementary plan documents or SPDs um, to complement certain policies in the plan. Uh, national policy um, encourages succinct local plans and clear and ambiguous policies. So believe it or not, we do have a succinct local plan um, and no repetition of national policy. But since the adoption of the local plan and since we've been using it in, in a practice, um, it's become apparent that further explanations required on the interpretation of, of certain policies. That's that's where SPDs come in. Um, SPDs are designed to give more detail and advice on interpretation of local and national policies at a local level. Um, they provide much needed clarity to officers and applicants. Um, they help clarify um, and elaborate on certain local policies and how they should be read and aid in decision making. They ensure consistency, upfront understanding, um, less ambiguity um, when applying these planning policies. Um, some matters, I think it's fair to say, are too detailed for the local plan to cover at length. So, for example, the plan might say a community facility must be marketed for 12 months. Well, an SPD can go into more detail on what is expected from that, from that marketing. Um, similarly, with a flood risk sequential test, it could go into details of, of what's required on there, and that's what these SPDs are doing. Um, so they provide many layers of details that can't be covered in the local plan but which are important to policy interpretation and will hopefully lead to better decision making in, in lines with the aims of the policy. Um, so as you'll be aware we've already adopted the biodiversity net gain SPD previously. Um, subsequent to that we consulted on and adopted four new SPDs um, which are now material considerations when determining plan applications. Um, so these are the flood risk SPD which assists in the interpretation of a uh, policy 57 and the expectations, um, especially where applications fall in areas of uh, the risk of flooding. 
It advised on the application of local and national flood risk policy for new developments, including sequential and exception tests, um, which is both an important and a complicated matter. The SPD should help ensure that flood risk is properly managed and the processes related to it are clear for all involved. Um, we've got the Local Labour Agreements SPD, which assists the interpretation of Policy 3 of the Local Plan, sets out the Council work local employers to maximise local employment and training opportunities um, for residents of Doncaster and employment developments, um, which should result in more than 20 jobs. Um, this will help local people to access jobs, training and upskilling when new employment sites are delivered in Doncaster and clarifies how this will be um, attained. We've got the loss of community facil uh, facilities and open space SPD, um, which clarifies the expectations of the council for applications where there's a loss of a community facility or an open space, um, which is proposed. Um, so this supports policies 27 and 51, um, which seeks to protect open space and community facilities in the city. Um, it helps strengthen the policy stance and ensures that there should be no loss of valuable community assets without thorough assessment and justification. Um, including thorough consultation, marketing, and assessment where relevant. And we've got the Technical Developer Requirements SPD. So this is a bit of a catch-all um, document which covers a range of policies in the local plan and technical matters that need to be considered when submitting a plan application. Um, these are general requirements from several internal council departments who are consulted frequently um, on plan applications and indeed will often sit here before you, um, such as pollution control, contaminated land, drainage, education, public rights of way, refuse and trees, um, amongst others. Um, so it's designed to ensure greater efficiency and less repetitive and time-consuming consultation between applicants and the council um, when undertaking planning uh, applications. So, um, in all cases, by setting the requirements out in these SPDs, it's clear from the outset for both applicants and decision makers what is expected from respective, uh, for respective plan applications. Um, they were formally adopt, adopted following a statutory six-week consultation earlier this year, um, where comments were taken on board and amendments were, were made subsequent to this. Um, there's a fairly modest response rate, so I think there's 17 in total um, across all four. Um, but we did we did make amendments based on, on what was put to us at the consultation. Um, there's a consultation report as well um, available online uh, alongside the SPDs. Um, I just want to highlight that SPDs have some limits as to what they can cover, so they must relate to adopted plans. They're not part of the development plan, but they are a material consideration in decision making. They cannot add new policies to the local plan. They can't alter policies even in light of new evidence. Uh, they cannot conflict with a local plan and they should not add unnecessary uh, financial burdens to development. So the SPDs have all been designed to meet these requirements. Um, we previously had several SPDs um, which were revoked following local plan adoption, although some elements remain in transitional developer guidance while we deliver new SPDs, so subsequent to the ones we've um, just adopted. Three we're working on, just for reference, um, is a rural development SPD a design code which will be in the form of an SPD and an SPD for household applications, so extensions and, and things like that. Um, the report you have before you is therefore recommending that four SPDs are used as material considerations and attributed weight in the determination of plan applications for the reasons set out and for the reasons I've hopefully elaborated on today, but I'm um, happy to answer any further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cox. Thank you, and thank you for, for this. Um, I, like, I like the uh, loss of community facilities and open space one, which, which would have been quite helpful in some previous applications. But yeah, um, what what with regard to the consultation, I see that you've put uh, post on Twitter. There are a number of people, including myself, that don't use Twitter or buy a newspaper. So is that in 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 the way of consultation, is it keeping some people out of that consultation that potentially could feed in? Um, I think the consultation was done in line with everything that's required in the statement of community involvement. Um, we did put paper copies in the um, in the lobby downstairs as well, and things like that. For us, it's not about excluding people; it's just those ways are now ways in which we can get um, further input, really. But um, we did all the normal consultation. I think we met the, the requirements of the statement of community involvement. Councillor Stapleton. Thank you, Chair. Um, my colleague, I, I agree, there's quite a lot of good work in here. There's a couple that I've got some concern with. First of all, I mean, just 
continuing to what Councillor Cox was saying there about the public consultation. It was only for a month, 17 responses, which includes the statutory consultees, members of the development industry and members of the public. I'd guess that the members of the public are a very small percentage, which is a bit of a shame, really, out of you know, a quarter of a million people. I'd, I'd suggest that perhaps in future we, we look at a better consultation than, than that. My biggest concern is these local labour agreements. I, I, I just see it is whoever's written this obviously has no idea what the job market's like at the minute. And that may change, I hope it does. But you know, you've, you've got record uh, job vacancies. Anybody that employs people will tell you it's practically impossible to get good staff. Um, you know, I mean, the overseas development work, the, the overseas um, sponsorship, I think it's, it's currently standing at about uh, half a million of the, since 2019. So, you know, we, we've got a massive, massive increase in workforce. None of that is, is local labour. Um, and I'm con my concern really is that how is that enforceable? Because a business, you know, trying to do a development, it needs, it needs construction workers. It, it, if it's a warehouse, it's going to need warehouse workers. I can almost guarantee you they could not d commit to a, a, a local labour agreement. They just can't. The, the, the market is, is not sustainable at the minute. I'm hoping, I mean, this, no, this is not really a question, it's just really, I suppose, just a comment really, that, that at the minute I, I don't see that is workable. I think most developers would look at that and, and would try and renegotiate, you know, that, that situation. Um, or the, I personally wouldn't even go into a local labour agreement, um, not, not on that condition and as it stands at the minute. So I think that, that perhaps would be worthy of a review. Or even a case by case basis. So, but apart from that, I just want to say, yeah, I think everything else is really good work, especially there around the open space um, and community facilities. Really good. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for the compliments. And uh, yeah, um, I think with the local labour agreements, um, unfortunately, I stumbled on the one of the four that got the least you know, in the way of, of responses. There wasn't a lot of interest in that. Um, when the local plan was drafted, which was pre-COVID. Um, we had this the commitment to local labour agreements and when it was going through the examination we had a promise in there that we do a local labour agreements SPD so that's um, that's what we've we've ended up with on that one but um, yeah th things are kept under under constant reviews and any suggestions as to how we can consult better uh, more than welcome you, you're right the, the public uh, feedback wasn't as much as the, the statutory consultees or the developer, uh, development industry but we can only work with unfortunately what we've got thank you get where you're coming from. Um, the, the, it relates to a policy. So the SPDs are there to underpin the policy. So policy three uh, deals specifically with local labor agreements. So uh, it's policy three, part C, for employment or other development for, uh, that propose 20 or more direct jobs, the council will seek to enter into a local labor agreement with the developer applicant that sets out the following. An agreement, uh, an agreed percentage of target for local labour, uh, a training and recruitment plan, and three, commitment to agree the target for the proportion of local procurement of services and supplies. So the, the, the premise or the spirit of that policy is really to try and grow and uh, empower and uh, better the workforce within Doncaster. So there's a, an angle here that um, the local plan is quite broad ranging, so it deals with various different strands across the council from education to housing to protection of particular areas to employment. Um, the spirit of what we're trying to get here is that there is an emphasis on effectively growing your own workforce. Uh, and so that's in partnership with people like Business Doncaster who are looking to develop these companies and make sure that we look after our own first. Um, I totally get where you're coming from where it's difficult to dictate to a company to say thou shalt use people from within Doncaster first I don't think that's what that's trying to do it's trying to um, steer developers to look at Doncaster first as a first option sequentially if you like look to see if you can employ local people first if you can't come back to us and tell us why so it might well be that you have a, partic a particular skill set that means you need uh, particular people from further afield. Right, thank you. I, 
I mean, the way I see it, it and I get it, you know, that there is a requirement, to, well, not a requirement, there's an appetite to, to encourage any developer uh, to have a, a local workforce agreement, but the reality is it's not enforceable. Even if you put it as part of a planning condition, it can't be enforced. You know, you, I, I, first time you try it, I guarantee you that a developer's going to take you to task on that because it's just not workable either. They're going to come back and, and, and they're going to renegotiate time and time again. Or, as I personally think, this is going to stifle growth of industry in Doncaster. That's my, my biggest concern. So, yeah. I can take that one. Okay, so I think invariably this comes out in a Section 106 agreement rather than a condition for employment sites and where I've um, negotiated them with the de with developers. And I think it is actually in the SPD, when you look at it, our standard form of wording, it does acknowledge that we may not be able to get this pool of workers from within Doncaster. And where that is the case, we allow them to go out further afield geographically. So there is that flexibility in the drafting in the 106. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. And I already knew, because I did some research on this, I knew it was part of the 106. Um, <laughs> There are 106 agreements out there that have been sat there in abeyance for God knows how many years because the, they just, some of them just get ignored anyway. Um, I, I could just see, you know, the, I, with the, the vast majority of businesses and developers that are, I'm trying to think the correct word so I don't trip myself up here, that are um, responsible, I can see them doing everything they can. But I could see this equally being abused um, to the point where yeah we may have it there it may go into 106 but it, it, it could be manipulated so they never have to do it and it, as I, say, it's, I just don't see it really as an enforceable thing anyway and, and I don't even question whether we should be in, in you know pushing it and enforcing it um, if people want to work they'll work you know um, and I, I have grave concerns that, that you know we've got huge huge vacancies at the minute and you know, putting the responsibility to get people into work straight onto developers, it, it seems to be well. You know, who else is doing? Uh, you know, trying to get the workforce growth because at the minute, if if we're having to rely purely on developers, then it's never going to happen. You know, there needs to be, a, I think, a broader approach to to developing the workforce. Cheers. Yeah, as I say, I, I get where you're coming from. I think the the important thing to note here is that. Um, and I think Chris touched on this, is that the, the policy position isn't changing. So policy three has been ex in existence since inception of the local plan going live, which was September 2021. So we're not doing anything different. That policy has been live for the best part of two years. Um, the SPDs are a layer below that, which tell you effectively how to interpret the policy and put some meat on the bones about um, these are the expectations that the council will uh, require in order for you to comply with that policy um, so we're not kind of moving the goalposts here and saying right we're now in a completely different policy situation we're now expecting everybody this has already been kind of dealt with um, we're, we're now just saying to people right in order to comply with that policy this is what we need you to do um, and the way that it's been written as Stacey has alluded to if, if it means that you can't comply with it then there's a way to go through and demonstrate how you can't comply with it. And, and that's all we're expecting. So if you're not going to comply with policy three, show us how, how you're not going to comply with it or why you're not going to comply with it. Um, and then we'll factor that into the balance and exercise of, of that policy. Yeah, thank you for that. I, 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 was, I, I do accept that the reason for it's there and, and it, it can be useful. I'm just talking about personal experience and knowing what the job market's like, it's going to be very difficult, but uh, thank you for that. Any more questions? Um, um, can I ask members to note the contents of the report and note that the newly adopted flood risk technical and development requirements, loss of community facilities and open space and local labour agreement supplementary planning documents are material consideration when determining planning applications. Is that agreed? Agreed. That's agreed. Thank you. Right, moving on to item nine, planning enforcement quarterly report, June 2023. The report is for information only. Darren Orton, planning enforcement officer, will introduce this item. Darren. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> yeah, uh, it's just to give a brief overview of the first quarter, which covers a period the April to June of this year. As uh, part of that, it 
Act covers cases received, closed, and those that are still currently pending investigation. Uh, included within that, we've got a no, you know a varied amount of cases, including injunction. Then we've got some temporary stop notices being served, some general notices, Section Two One Five cases, as well as general cases, and then those which revert to banners and advertisements. So anything that's relating to um, items included within that quarterly report, I shall endeavour to answer as, as, as much as I can. Thank you. Would any members like to address? Just like to comment to you. I know it's not your fault. Oh, I wish they didn't take so long to go through appeals and courts because I am sick to death of being asked about one on here. It goes back to March 2022. <laughs> so, you know, every, t every time it's on the um, manager's meeting, which is Thursday, it'll be, what's that? <laughs> the caravans, uh, Moss Road, Moss, Bethel House. <laughs> It's, uh, it's held in a bounds for the inspectorate now. Chair, can I just, can, sorry, can I just clarify, so is this meeting still being recorded as a public meeting? Yes, Thank it you. is. No further questions. <laughs> Any further questions? Steve Cox? Thank you. With with that one in Wheatley, Kings Road, that I mean, it's it, it's great to see that somebody's been out there and it, it it's been well. I think the recommended recommendation is to demolish it in its entirety. Um, we have we do seem to see a lot of things being applied for retrospectively, and. How how is this going to be addressed moving forward? If if they decide not to knock it down, what happens then? All right, so I'm just trying to find it now. Yeah. Right, so this is an so this is a uh, regarding a notice that's been served on the property on the tenth of August, and and so we don't know if they've actually decided to appeal against this enforcement notice yet. I mean, when, when a, an application either comes in or an enforcement notice is served, they do have the right of appeal. And then, obviously, it's dealt with by a completely separate organisation, which is the planning inspectorate. In the event that they would overturn it and say that it does require demolition, then I think that is virtually as far as it's going to go. I, think, I don't think they've got any other option available to them. We do have an example of one such case where an upper floor was actually... It was made, you know, to remove the upper level in... Oh, it's just outside the town centre. And, um, and that was after an appeal as well. And I think that was subject to a few court appearances before he was actually... before he complied with the, you know, the details of that notice. But I understand what you mean, uh, you know, regarding applications that are submitted retrospectively. Unfortunately, <laughs> we are a reactive service, so that's all we can do. Steve, if I just jump in. So the question was, what happens if they don't comply? At the moment, given how close it is that we've just 
served them with a notice, i.e. the 10th of August, they'll have a period in which they have to comply with the notice before it takes effect, um, unless they make an appeal. So we're waiting until that time's elapsed, at which time they either made an appeal, in which case it goes into the system and works its way through, or they complied with the notice, i.e. they've demol demolished what they needed to demolish, complied with the notice, the notice stands, but it, it effectively means that we take no further action. If we run it through, and they um, appeal, the appeal is then dismissed, the enforcement notice will be held, the next stage is they have to then comply with the notice. If we don't comply with the notice, we're into the next stage, which is prosecution, which then means it forces the hand to do what we need to do. That can keep running. There are other tools within the, the council's arsenal. Uh, they could, for example, decide that they're gonna do direct action, which would be that we do the, the work to demolish it and then bill them for the work that we've done. So there are other mechanisms that we could do. We could keep prosecuting, for example. So it, it's not simply the end of the road that we get enforcement notice, we win the appeal, and then nothing else happens. We continue that forward until we've got proper control over that. Um, I suppose your secondary question, which is about retrospective planning applications. So I have a regular meeting with the enforcement team every week and we go through cases that are on the books at the moment and we have a discussion as to whether or not to invite a planning application, a retrospective one, or whether to go straight for enforcement action. Um, there are instances where the breach is so blatant and clear that it wouldn't be supported via the policies within the local plan. So there's no point in inviting a planning application and going through that process where we cle it's clearly not in conformity with it. So it would make sense to go straight for an enforcement notice and, and go through that process. So that, that line of communication is open to make sure that we're getting the right balance between applications coming forward for consideration, invariably some of them then come in front of planning committee uh, for you to make the call on. But uh, it's largely applications where there's a semblance where the, the principle of development can be supported based upon information that could then also be used to supplement those applications. How, how many times o over over years has, has anything actually been demolished? Because I only I personally I think know of one, and that one next to racecourse near racecourse being what used to be Rovers, yeah, and it stood as a shell for decades I think. Well, to my knowledge, there, there's only two that I know of. The, the one that I mentioned in Hexthorpe, it was where the owner was made to remove an upper floor. And the other one that I know of was a site in Psych House, where it was a holiday chalet that um, we uh, actually did a direct action to remove that because the owner was so obstructive. So in my time, they're the two things that I know definitely have either been subject to a direct action or the owner has eventually complied. I mean, the others may well have had some form of merit whereby an application could have been invited and then approved. Right, thank you. Any more questions? No, thank you. Can I ask the committee members to move that the report to be noted? That we agree. Yeah. Right. Right, members, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes today's business meeting. Um, I would like to thank everyone for their attendance and input. Now I declare the meeting closed. Thank you.